this week on ICN. The stories you should have heard, but didn't. Audit the Fed bill goes under the knife in Congress. New York Health Commissioner's connection to Goldman Sachs and vaccine maker. Department of Homeland Security getting ready for the swine flu to slow down the internet. U.S. Army illegally deployed in small Alabama town earlier this year. Those stories and more next on Informed Citizen News. Hello and welcome to ICN, Informed Citizen News, November 1st, 2009. Ron Paul's Audit the Fed bill is in process of being gutted as it works its way toward a possible vote in the Democratic-controlled House. Congressman Paul said that the bill has been stripped of provisions that would remove Fed exemptions from audits of transactions with foreign central banks, monetary policy deliberations, transactions made under the direction of the Federal Open Market Committee, and communications between the board, the reserve banks, and the staff. He added that Mel Watt, a Democrat from North Carolina, has eliminated just about everything while preparing the legislation for formal consideration. Watt is chairman of the panel's Domestic Monetary Policy and Technology Subcommittee. Watt's North Carolina district includes Charlotte, the headquarters of Bank of America, the biggest U.S. lender. Paul said he intends to introduce an amendment to the bill when it comes to the House floor for a vote, restoring the legislation's original language. Questions are being raised about a potential conflict of interest for New York State Health Commissioner Danes related to his mandate that all health care workers be vaccinated for H1N1. When the original order was made, the inference was that New York health care workers would be on the front lines of the so-called battle against H1N1 and they should not only all be vaccinated but should be the first to receive their shots. It was deemed critical. With a reported shortage of vaccines, they are now far less critical, which seems counterintuitive, and Danes rescinded his mandate. The potential conflict of interest surrounds Richard Danes' wife, Linda Danes, who manages private client services for none other than Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs was the largest shareholder and brokered a 2007 $15 billion sale of the vaccine giant Metamune, who happens to be a manufacturer of the H1N1 vaccine. When first asked about the potential conflict a few weeks ago, Commissioner Danes acted insulted and was shocked that the reporter would even ask such a question. When the reporter followed up this week seeking an answer, Danes responded that he adheres to the state's policy on con conflicts of interest and that the reporter is barking up the wrong tree. At least he provided a response the second time the question was asked. Now that the mandatory vaccination has been rescinded, the conflict of interest question hanging over the commissioner will likely fade away. A recent Government Accountability Office report recommended that the Department of Homeland Security start preparing to manage internet traffic congestion in case of a flu pandemic. The premise of the report was, with people forced to work from home, internet traffic could exceed its capacity. According to the report, DHS should be prepared to arrange for legal authority to take action and avoid interruptions in what they deemed critical commerce conducted over the Internet. Recommendations in the report of concern were having the government endorse Internet service providers to reduce their customer bandwidth allowance, even if it violated the customer's agreement. Another option in the report was that overall Internet congestion could be reduced if websites were shut down for sites that accounted for significant amounts of traffic, such as those with video streaming. People would have limited access to information and news. The most disturbing aspect of the report was that the unnamed Internet providers wouldn't take these actions to restic restrict customer Internet access unless directed by the government, but had no problems doing so if the government said it was okay. Back in March, Following a shooting spree by a disgruntled worker that left 11 people dead across two small towns in Alabama, the Army was called in to support local police. An Army report released to the Associated Press in October in response to a Freedom of Information Act request said the decision to dispatch military to Sampson, Alabama from nearby Fort Rucker broke the law. According to the report, the Army officer who made the decision to send the soldiers thought he had the authority based on his experience with responses to Hurricanes Katrina and Andrew. 
The report from the Department of Army Inspector General found the use of military personnel in Sampson violated the Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits federal troops from performing law enforcement actions. As a result of the findings of the report, the Army took administrative action against at least one person. But no arrests, ditch, discharge, or transfers were included in the disciplinary actions. The New York Times reported that the brother of the Afghan president Karzai and a suspected player in the country's booming illegal opium trade has been getting regular payments from the CIA for most of the past eight years according to current and former American officials. The CIA pays Mr. Karzai for a variety of services including helping to recruit an Afghan paramilitary force that operates at the CIA's direction in and around the southern city of Kandahar. Mr. Karzai's home. Some American counter-narcotics officials have said they believe that Mr. Karzai has expanded his influence over the drug trade, thanks in part to American efforts to single out other drug lords. After eight years in Afghanistan and no end in sight, it continues to be hard to tell the good guys from the bad. Bloomberg reported that then New York Fed Governor Geithner left at least $13 billion of taxpayer money on the table for banks to rank in during the liquidation of AIG assets. In the months leading up to the September 2008 collapse of the giant insurer, the AIG division CFO worked nights and weekends negotiating with banks that had bought $62 billion of credit default swaps from AIG. One of his goals was to persuade the banks to accept discounts of as much as 40 cents on the dollar, according to people familiar with the matter. By September 16, 2008, AIG, once the world's largest insurer, was running out of cash and the U.S. government stepped in with a rescue plan. The government's commitment to AIG through credit facilities and investments would eventually add up to $182.3 billion. Geithner led the effort and circulated a term sheet that had a space scratched out that would have indicated the haircut that firms like Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch were to take. This ensured that Wall Street firms would get 100 cents on the dollar back from their bad investments in mortgage-backed security insurance products. As a reminder, when Geithner left the New York Fed to become Obama's Treasury Secretary, his replacement, Stephen Friedman, became chairman of the New York Fed while still serving on the board of directors for Goldman Sachs. Edmunds.com estimated that the Cash for Clunkers program stimulated an extra 125,000 car sales that might not have otherwise been sold during the last couple of months. For the $3 billion government program, that translates to taxpayer funding of $24,000 per car sold. In another report, the single most common swap, which occurred more than 8,200 times, involved Ford F-150 pickup owners who took advantage of a government rebate to trade their old trucks for new Ford F-150s. The AP report also pointed out that a number of investigations are underway related to trade-ins that received clunker funds but didn't meet the increased fuel efficiency mandated by government as car salesmen were eager to close the deal. Earlier this year, ICN reported the troubles facing public and private pensions. With typically 60% or more of all pension assets invested in stocks, they have taken a big haircut since the market peaked in 2007. It was reported this week that the pension system that provides benefits for 365,000 Illinois teachers has barely one-third of what it needs to pay promised benefits. Additionally, retirement accounts for state and local government employees lost $600 billion this past year, a decline of 21 percent. More declines are expected over the next few years, putting Americans' retirement in jeopardy. And finally, the U.S. Postal Service can't make a profit in delivering the mail, so they are looking into new ventures. About 1,500 post offices nationwide started selling Hallmark greeting cards, part of a one-year experiment that may lead to all 34,000 postal outlets selling the cards and offer other goods and services, including banking, insurance, and cell phones. If all goes well, maybe you'll be able to pick up your dry cleaning, a movie rental, and a rotisserie chicken at your local post office. Thanks for joining us this week. Please continue to share our channel with friends and family. From all of us at Informed Citizen News, have a great week.